I come back to the food aisle, and I couldn't find my mom. I was like, she was right there. And, I, and the first thing that came to my thought, I'm going to get kidnapped. <laughs> and so I just, I, just, I, just, I just sat down, and I started crying. I was scared. I didn't know who anyone was. I looked around, and I was like, what do I do now? And then pretty soon, my mom comes up with a car, and she's like, what are you doing? I was looking for you. And I was like, she didn't look very happy, but I, I was very happy to see her, though. And I gave her a hug. I was like, I won't leave you again, Mom. And, you know, it reminds me of how God tells us we have to stay near him and to stay always close to him. But then sometimes we're like, oh, I'll, I'll be back later. I'll come back. And we leave God, and then we can't find him again. And I just want to encourage you all to stay near God and also near your parents. And you can go back to your seats now. Hopefully we have a God who runs after us, seeks us out, gives us a desire to come back if that does happen. Thank you for that, Uncle Jose. Um, you know, it is a blessing. Uh, mothers, we talked about, are a blessing. I'd just like to have us give a few one-word descriptions of mothers. Help me out. Someone, someone over this side. Okay. Patient. Excellent. I have found that in my own mother with me. Patience, yes. How about from this section? Long-suffering. Now, those are two pretty close things, but they're a little different, but it shows more of the same. Good. Oh, sacrifice for sure. Yes, giving up nights of sleep and uh, many other things too. Okay, Alicia? Nurture. Nurture, absolutely. And you know, it takes both a man and a woman together to show perfectly the image of God, his character, what he's like. And he is such a nurturing God to us, too. Gentleness. Absolutely. We see that more in our moms sometime than our dads. <laughs> uh, gentleness, yes. Disciplinarian. Okay. You know, sometime mama rules with a, what, chunkla? Chocla? <laughs> That right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Sometimes we need, we, we need that correction. I'm thankful for a God who corrects us, too. Doesn't let things just keep going. Well, we could go on and on, I'm sure, with lots of different descriptions. One I thought of, too, is goes along with sacrifice, is giving. Mothers are giving. They give little gifts. They give of their time. They give sacrificially. And that reminds me of our God who gave the best gift of all in Jesus. And then he gives to us. Everything we have comes from where? From him. And he gives us the privilege of being able to give and be blessed in giving what didn't even start with us. We can hardly claim it. We are just what? Stewards of his things. And then we get a blessing by giving a portion of what we have to him. We return our tithes. We give a free will offering. In saying, in so doing, say, it all came from you, Lord. And I want to acknowledge that. And then he gives us the blessing of giving. And it always comes back. Because Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And what an, what a, what an opportunity. Every time there's a call for an offering is an opportunity to be like Jesus. To be like our loving, giving God. And like our... Uh, that, that we see a little bit of in our, in our mothers. And so just now, uh, those who want to give to a world budget, especially to disaster relief and famine relief, you can put that on your tithe envelope. All the loose offering will go toward our church budget uh, in Amity here. This is not our usual uh, meeting place. We don't have room for all of us in there. Uh, we'd have room for about half of you there in Amity. But we will have room soon. Um, Anyway, right now we have an opportunity to give, to acknowledge his giving to us. So may the Lord bless you richly as, as you give, uh, as he did.
Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your gifts to us, the best one in Jesus. And for all the rest, we know that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And I pray that you would bless these gifts that are simply returned that you've given to us. May you uh, expand and make efficient these offerings to do your will on this planet. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today's scripture reading will be from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you would like to turn there. Acts chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Reading from the King James Version. Let me know when you're there with an amen. Awesome. Okay. And it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. There's a story. Good. There's a story that um, happened many years ago, but it impacts each and every one of us in this room. There was a notorious prisoner in his cell, and he was on death row. Um, he was a murderer, thief, you name it, and they had caught him because he was a leader of or trying to take back their nation from the regime that was overpowering them. And as he sat there, you know, in that regime, they don't just let you sit, your, sit there in your death row cell. They put you to work to build your own instrument of torture. And as he is building this, this machine, what is someone supposed to think? The, the torturers not only want you to go through physical agony at the end, but the mental agony as well as you're building your instrument. And all he can think of is, was he sorry because of what he had done? Or was he sorry that he had been caught? He didn't know. He was just... As he finished the, the instrument, all he could think of was the many expectations he had failed. Everything, should he have done something different? Why, why was he feeling this... What is someone supposed to feel when they're going to die? He should have never been caught in the first place. That's, that's what he boiled it down to. He should have done that better, not to get caught. And as he's sitting there, what he didn't realize is that outside the federal prison, a crowd started to gather, and they started getting agitated and, and mad and, and started yelling things, and that's when it caught his attention. He could start hearing something that they were yelling. And um, he strained. And finally he heard it. They were yelling, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. What? No, no, no. He, he was at least supposed to have a few days. This couldn't be happening. It was a national holiday, and they don't usually execute prisoners during a national holiday. And as he started to freak out, he, he strained for something else, and all he could hear was, crucify him, crucify him. No, this couldn't be happening. It was supposed to be a few more days. He should have never gotten caught in the first place. But this was it. This was it. He was going to die. They wanted his life, and, and they hated him, and so this was going to boil down to. He didn't even fight. Like, when the soldiers came to grab him, he, energy left him. Everything was drained from him. He had finished his instrument just in time. And as they carried him away, he neared towards the crowd. He, they realized, he realized they were so angry and presented his case, but this man was silent. He said nothing to defend himself, and Bravas knew that he was innocent. He had been beaten and stripped naked, and they put a cross on him 
but wait, he didn't have enough time. How did, how did he make his own cross? Wait. He assumed it was his own cross because it was the only one that was empty now that Barabbas was free. Was he taking his place? Was this man taking my place? As We don't know how long Barabbas stood around that scene, how long he stood near Jesus, whether he heard the words that Jesus spoke on the cross before he died, but there was one thing Barabbas knew, that Jesus had taken his place. Did you know that each and every one of us are on death row? Whether you're sorry for what you did or you're sorry that you got caught, whether you think you're innocent or you think that you're, you're wrong, someone has to die for what you did. But Jesus is willing to take your place. He's already done it. The gift is yours. And it's up to us to accept this gift. And as J. Rose and Maboshe sing about this gift, they want you to turn to 156 as you can meditate on the words. At this time, I want to invite you all to sing with us on page 154, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and together we will sing stanza one and four. When I survey the
Well, good morning, and happy Sabbath to all of you here this morning. I hope you've been blessed already. I'm blessed just hearing the singing here today, and I praise the Lord for all of your voices joining in in the song. Well, uh, as Brother Powell mentioned, I this is not my place of, uh, what would I say, I don't naturally like to stand up front like this. But sometimes God puts a fire in your soul and you can't keep quiet or he opens the door and you feel the necessity to speak. So I'm glad you're here today. Now normally I wouldn't present this presentation on a Sabbath morning divine service, partly because when I do a series, um, there's often people in church on Sabbath that maybe had, weren't here on a Friday night or earlier in the week, like a week of prayer or something like that. And so what I present today is building on other presentations. So I just want those of you to know that if you're coming just today, that we had a presentation last night and what I'm presenting today is built on what I talked about last night. So there's more to the story than just what I'm talking about today. Um, so just briefly, last night we talked about how God, even in the scriptures, has written down history for us. Not only to encourage us about his character, the whole tell us about the great controversy, the plan of salvation, but to warn us from making the mistakes of those that have gone before us. And that's why the Bible has many stories, stories of you know, good men and women who have made mistakes and who God in his mercy has guided them, many repenting and turning to him, others not. And all of those stories are warnings to us. But God, through inspired counsel, has also told us that we have nothing to fear as a people for the future unless we forget the way God has led us in the past. And as you know, many of us today are praying, we pray as a church, we pray as, as individuals, that God would pour out his spirit on us as a people and pour out the latter rain. We look forward to it and we long for it. But I think there are stories from our past that would be good for us to know lest we repeat those mistakes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So again, last night we talked about that history, how it's important. We talked about how God raised up this movement, the early 1840s, how they studied out the fundamental beliefs of this church, how God sent a, the spirit of prophecy manifested through uh, the teachings and the writings of Ellen White to guide us as a people. And then we talked about how the Laodicean condition actually kind of settled in on that first generation. As early as 1852, uh, Ellen White wrote that that a part of Revelation uh, chapter 3 did not apply to the other Protestant churches that had rejected the Sabbath, that it actually was speaking more primarily of us as an Advent movement. Then we talked about kind of some of the things that might have brought that condition on and, and how it was preached for a few years there, how the next generation came along. And sometime around the 1880s, James and Ellen White, Lord impressed them that there was an, an emphasis that needed to come to the church. And James White even had a reconversion experience. He began to preach and lift up Christ more. They ch he changed the picture that they used for evangelistic series. And then he chose to stay in Battle Creek instead of go to where he could write about these subjects and he ended up dying. But God promised Ellen White on his deathbed that he would raise up others. And we uh, talked about how in 1882, El God not only healed Ellen White, but God also raised up others. And I believe it was in fulfillment of that promise to help lift this message up to the, us as a people, that message of righteousness by faith. So today we're going to talk about the most important meeting. But before we really get into that, I want to talk a little bit about the latter rain. And, you know, I, I have a presentation where I spend probably 
a good part of an hour talking about this. So I'm just going to look at a couple of slides here. But oftentimes, sometimes we can think that the latter rain, the Holy Spirit comes, and he just kind of gives us power, just this nebulous power. But I want us to see that when we pray for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's duty is to enlighten our minds. Notice in Deuteronomy, this is a song of Moses that he gave right before they crossed the, the people crossed the Jordan before Moses died. And notice what he says in Deuteronomy 32, verse 1 and 2. He says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Of course, he's speaking for God here. My doctrine shall drop as rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. So here, Moses compares doctrine or teaching to rain. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit being poured out, we're actually, and this would be a good study to do some Sabbath afternoon, is look through the scriptures and how this theme you'll find throughout the scriptures. Notice here then another verse, we, uh, Joel 2.23, talking about the early and latter rain. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I understand you guys in the college here take Hebrew. So look up the Hebrew word here, because S.N. Haskell pointed out that in the marginal reading, the Hebrew actually brings out that that former rain, can, there's a part of that text there that can be translated teacher of righteousness. So when we're talking about the Holy Spirit coming, we're talking about the Holy Spirit coming to teach us about righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. And here's how it's translated in several other translations. Well, what about Pentecost? Do we see this theme happening at Pentecost when those disciples got together and prayed for 10 days, put aside their differences, prayed and repented, and the Holy Spirit was poured out. Notice what Ellen White says here. The Savior knew that when the Holy Spirit should come upon them, the disciples, in full measure, notice, their minds would be illuminated and they would fully understand the work before them and take it up just where he had left them. If you were to talk to the disciples a couple days before the cross, what was their perception of the kingdom of God compared to 50 days later? They were still fighting among themselves who was gonna be the greatest. They totally misunderstood, even to that point, the three and a half years lessons that Jesus had been teaching them. But after this, after the cross, and when they prayed and the Holy Spirit was poured out, their minds were illuminated and they began to understand what Christ had been seeking to teach them for those three and a half years. Here's another statement Ellen White makes. When the Spirit was poured out from on high, the church, early church, was flooded, notice, what with? With light. But Christ was the source of that light. His name was on every tongue. His love filled every heart. So when the Holy Spirit come, comes, he's Christ's representative, and his duty, his responsibility, what he's doing is to present light and truth and doctrine and understanding. And that's where the power comes from. It's not just, that's where the power comes from. It's not just a nebulous, you know, lightning strike. It's truth that has power. So it will be, notice Ellen White says, when the angel that comes down from heaven having great power shall lighten the whole earth with his glory. So she compares, that's what will happen at the end of time when the loud cry goes forth, when the latter rain prepares the people for that. It's teaching, it's truth that will enable that. One more statement. When the mighty angel descends from heaven clothed with the panoply, word we don't often use, it means armor, of heaven and gives strength to the third angel, the power of the message is felt by them. That's where the power is. The heavenly showers fall on them, the latter rain drops in, those, in their vessels. So here the Ellen White's making parallel statements here. The latter rain, the heavenly showers, is that power of the message that God sends through the Holy Spirit, which enables God's people to then go forth and preach 
the loud cry to the world. And that is what that first generation had been praying for and talking about for 40 years when you come to the summer of 1888. Now, Ellen White had been in Australia for a couple of years, uh, I'm sorry, in England for, or Europe for a couple of years, 85 to 87. She had returned. There was political strife in this country. There were a national Sunday law was before Congress, summer of 88. There was financial trouble in, in the United States, uh, like I said, political issues. Um, the world seemed ripe for those closing events. Well, that very summer, Ellen White had a very interesting dream. And notice how she described this. I was in an assembly when a man of noble, majestic stature came in and took his position on the platform, and he unrolled something which looked like several long leaves fastened together. And as he turned the pages, his hand ran down the page and his eyes swept over the congregation. And as he turned the pages from right to left, I could see what was on them. So Ellen White has this dream, uh, an angel obviously, or Christ himself was unrolling papers and turning pages, and there were things listed on, these, on this paper. Notice what is said. She said then, I saw there different names, characters, and sins that were written down. There were sins of every description, selfishness and envy and pride and jealousy and evil surmising, hypocrisy, licentiousness, and then hatred and murder in the heart because of the envy and jealousy. These sins were right among the ministers and people. Page after page was turned. Well, how was this? Ellen White obviously asked in her dream. And a voice said that the time had come when the work in heaven is all activity for the inhabitants of this world. The time had come when the temple and its worshipers had to be measured. Summer, 1888. This is quoting from Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, if you're familiar with that measuring of the temple. Measuring the church and its individual members this is what I saw, she says, and I woke up and found myself sitting up in bed in great drops of perspiration on my brow. brow. I felt paralyzed. Significant was happening in heaven, and God was telling her, the time has come. The temple is ready. The church is going to be measured and its individual members, and yet here is this list of sins going on in people's lives. This was an important meeting. Somehow she observed this. Well, it's interesting that Ellen White had a similar dream or similar dreams at other times. And notice how she put it in this, uh, uh, as she wrote about this another time. She said, during the night, I seemed to be in a meeting, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> presenting the necessity and importance of our receiving the Spirit. This was the burden of my labor to opening of our hearts to the Holy Spirit. In my dream, a sentinel stood at the door of an important building and asked everyone who came for entrance, have ye received the Holy Ghost? A measuring line was in his hand and only very, very few were admitted into the building. All who go in through their, this door have on the wedding garment woven in the loom of heaven. So notice there was two things. Do you have the Holy Spirit? And are you wearing that robe of Christ's righteousness? And that's what this sentinel was measuring, I believe, that day when she had this dream in the summer of 1888. Well, after this dream, some things happened, Ellen White said, which caused me great sadness, and it was there that I sank under the burden. I do not care for myself. I would as leave lay down my life now <clears throat> as at any future time. I felt no desire to recover. I had no power even to pray and no desire to live as I lay for two weeks in nervous prostration, I had hoped that no one would even beseech the throne of grace in my behalf. When the crisis came, it was the impression that I would die, and this was my thought, but it was not the will of my heavenly Father. So this dream that Ellen White had, the summer of 88, was made such an impression on her, along with other things going on, that it actually brought her to the point of becoming sick and almost to the point of death. In fact, she thought she would die and she hoped no one would pray for her. 
But people did. There were some who did pray for her. And the Lord did end up raising her up for a purpose. Well, she was so impressed by this dream that in August she wrote a letter to the brethren who shall assemble in the general conference. So she, to all the ministers, she sent a letter out. This was an open letter, I guess you could call it. And in that letter, notice what she says. We are impressed that this gathering will be the most important meeting you have ever attended. All selfish ambition should be laid aside and you should plead with God for his spirit to descend upon you as it came upon the disciples who were assembled together upon the day of Pentecost. What's she saying? We should be preparing for the latter rain, just like the disciples were preparing for the early rain, by spending days together praying for one another, putting aside differences and seeking the Holy Spirit. Well, as I said, God did raise her up from her deathbed. She got on a train in early October 2 and headed to the general conference that would meet in Minneapolis. Now this was a new church that had been built there in Minneapolis. They, I think they fit almost 500 people in there. Um, there was only about 28,000 church members in the Adventist church at the time. And so this general conference, there was about 97 delegates which represented the leadership of the entire Adventist church meeting together at this conference. And it started with the ministerial institute where they would study the Bible on different topics that went on for a week and then they would meet for the next three weeks going over church matters uh, there at the general conference. And when Ellen White showed up, she actually spoke nearly 20 times at this general conference and there's, uh, I don't recall now how many, not all of them were recorded, but we do have some of her sermons and talks that she gave there. The very first morning, this is what she said in her morning talk. Now, as we have assembled here, we want to make the most of our time, but we too often let opportunities slip away, and we do not realize that benefit from them which we should. If ever we needed the Holy Ghost to be with us, if ever we needed to preach in the demonstration of the Spirit, it is at this very time. And she had a reason for saying that. There were, there were Sunday laws being pushed on the country at that very time, plus all those other things I mentioned earlier. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, Ellen White said, will come upon us, where, when? At this very meeting, if we will have it so. If you do a word search on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's many times where Ellen White uses that same word, baptism of the Holy Spirit, in the context of the latter rain. Let us commence right here in this meeting and not wait till the meeting is half through. We want the Spirit of God here now, and we need it, and we want to be, it to be revealed in our characters. Well, <clears throat> the next day, Ellen White said, Now, brethren, I have felt one of the most solemn burdens ever since I returned from Europe. I will tell you, as I told my friends in Oakland, I feel horribly afraid to come into this conference. And why would she say that? Well, she told them why. I have been awake at night after night with scenes of agony for the people of God that sweat would roll off from me. Some things fearfully impressive were presented to me. And then she tells the story about the dream she had of that sentinel, the summer of 88. Well, what was the problem? What, why there was controversy there? And I don't have time this morning to go into any of that, but basically this actually fits along with the Sabbath school lesson. Protestants had used the verse in Galatians 3.24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And they had said, yeah, that was in the Old Testament, and once the, that schoolmaster brought us to Christ, then we did away with the law. Now in early Adventist times, in the 1850s, Adventist Church had taught that the schoolmaster was both the moral and the ceremonial law. But when that opposition from Protestant churches had really, you know, increased as Adventism came into being, most of the ministers began to take the stance that the schoolmaster was only the ceremonial law. And that's why we say the old guard is what they were called. They took that position. So when Jones and Wagner showed up in 1886, started writing and saying, actually, 
all law, the schoolmaster represents primarily the, the Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments show us our need of a Savior, of Christ. This, to some of the ministers, felt like they were doing away with the Ten Commandments. And that's what started some of the controversy. Well, on the uh, second or third day of the ministerial meetings, G.I. Butler, the conference president, he was actually so concerned with what he felt was going on that he was homesick in bed. And he wrote a 40-page letter, 39-page letter to Ellen White. And he really let her have it. If you ever get a chance, you ought to read that letter. It's available to read even today. And Ellen White, a couple days later, responded with a 20-page letter to uh, G.I. Butler, and she let him know that he was not seeing things straight or correctly. And in that letter, she says this, the spirit and influence, this was Sunday, October 14, the spirit and influence of the ministers generally who have come to this meeting is to discard light. From the, this night's work, there will arise false imaginings, cruel and unjust misunderstandings that will work like leaven in every church. Not just there, but every church. And close hearts to the striving of the Spirit of God. The influence of this meeting will be as far-reaching as where? Eternity. Well, what was the problem? Why was there this opposition? Well, we mentioned it just a little bit, but there was also a debate of spirit. In fact, when you showed up the first day of the Ministerial Institute, there was a, a, a chalkboard at the front of the church, and on it had been written, resolved that the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law. And J.H. Morrison, he was the conference president from Iowa, he had signed his name, and he was, this was a debate. He was ready to debate. The other side said, resolved that the law in Galatians is the moral law, and he wanted Wagner to sign that, and then they were going to have a debate. Well, Wagner refused to sign it. This is W.C. White set in on the meetings, and this is uh, what, how he took notes, and he said um, that Morrison's style was very polemic. It was debative or, or um, controversial. He maintained, Morrison did, that they'd always believed in justification by faith. He contended the subject had been overstated at the conference, and he was fearful that the law might lose its importance in the place where it belonged. Another thing happened while Morrison was up presenting uh, his side of what he felt was his understanding. Ellen White, who often sat in the front row, would get up and leave the church while he was preaching. But when Wagner was presenting, she was sitting there saying, Amen. And this caused more trouble. Well, when Jones and Wagner had an opportunity to stand up and to share in the Bible meetings right after uh, Morrison had presented, they got up and they alternated in reading sections of the scripture without any comment. And when they got done, they sat down. Fifty some years later, R.T. Nash, who was there as an eyewitness, he tells the story and he says, this was their only answer and without a word or comment, they took their seats. And during the, during the entire time of the readings, there was a hush stillness over the vast assembly. And I believe that was the Holy Spirit there impressing people that it was the inspired word that was being proclaimed during those Bible talks. And it did have an impression on the people there. Well, the time of the latter rain. This is another interesting thing that kind of came up in that conference. The first time that Ellen White ever uses the term, the time of the latter rain, that I can find was on this day, October 15, 1888, at the ministerial meeting. She says, it is high time, in her morning talk, that we awake out of sleep and that we seek the Lord with all the heart. I know who he will be found of us. I know that all heaven is at our command. Just as soon as we love God with all our hearts and our neighbor as ourselves, God will work through us. How, she asked, how shall we stand in the time of the latter rain? Who expects to have a part in the first resurrection? Who, you, who have been cherishing sin and iniquity in the heart, you will fail in that day. So Ellen White is, base, is she saying, how are we going to stand now in the time of the latter rain? 
If you're cherishing iniquity, you will fail in that day. Well, in 1897, she says, let us with contrite hearts pray most earnestly that now, in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace may fall upon us. In 1899, she says, years ago, the time came for the Holy Spirit to descend in a special manner upon God's earnest, self-sacrificing workers. So clearly, when she says years ago in 1899, she meant at least back to 1888. In fact, G.B. Starr, wrote, who spent 10 years with her in, in uh, Australia, said this in 1893 in a letter to A.T. Jones. He says, Sister White says that we have been in the time of the latter rain since the Minneapolis meetings. Several years later, he wrote a manuscript, and this is how he described it. He says, it was my privilege to attend the general conference at Minneapolis. There, the subject of righteousness by faith was emphasized as it had never before been among SDA ministers. Sister White was present and daily threw influence in decided words with the presentations of this subject. She stated that this marked the beginning of the latter rain and the loud cry of the third angel's message. That was the significance of this general conference. God they had been preparing for this time and people had been praying for it. Well, the uh, Ministerial Institute ended and the actual general conference began on October 17. The very next morning, Ellen White presented a morning talk in, in which she made this statement. Brethren and sisters, there is a great need at this time of humbling ourselves before God, that the Holy Spirit may come upon us. May God help us that his spirit may be made manifest among us. We should not wait until we go home to obtain the blessing of heaven. Those who have been long in the work have been far too content to what? To wait for the showers of the latter rain to revive them. In other words, don't look off in the future. Now's the time to be preparing and to be open to receive what God wants to do bless us with. The very next morning, October 19, she said this, we should seek to have our actions of such a character that we will not shrink from having our Savior look upon them. Then notice what she says. Christ is here this morning, October 19. Angels are here. And what are they doing? They're measuring the temple of God and those who worship therein. This is the exact words that were spoken to her in the summer of 1888, in that dream. She connects what she saw that summer on October 19 to what was taking place. What she had been shown in the summer that brought her such gripping fear was what she observed in Minneapolis. The history of this meeting, she continues, will be carried up to God for a record of every meeting is made. The spirit manifested, the word spoken, and the actions performed are noted in the books of heaven. Everything is transferred to the records as faithfully as our features to the polished plate of the artist. In other words, God is taking account of what's happening here. The next morning, October 20, in her morning talk, she says this. Here I want to tell you what a terrible thing it is if God gives light and it is impressed on your heart and spirit for you to do as they did, she was talking about. God will withdraw his spirit unless his truth is accepted. Do you see how those are connected? It's when God sends his spirit, it's because he's bringing truth to our hearts. If we reject the truth, we're rejecting the Holy Spirit and that spirit can be withdrawn. October 24, the last day Ellen White would speak at the conference, even though it went into the first week of November. Now our meeting is drawing to a close, she said, and not one confession has been made. There has not been a single break so as to let the spirit of God in. Now I was saying, what was the use of our assembling here together and our ministering brethren to come in if they are here only to shut out the Spirit of God 
from the people. What is the reason the Spirit of God does not come into our meetings? It's because we have built a barrier around us. I speak decidedly because I want you to realize where you are standing. I tell you, some of Ellen White's most, what would I say? Um, I don't know even what word to use. Some of her, her greatest appeals are made in these sermons that she gave at Minneapolis. And of course you understand, here are all the ministers gathering. God is intending to pour out truth and a message and the Holy Spirit upon his church. The leadership and laity gathered there so that they could take it out to the other 20 some thousand members and then take it to the world. And yet there was this resistance found there. Well what had caused this? Again we mentioned a little bit earlier but when Ellen White was sitting in the meeting, she w would say this, you know, when Brother Ragnar brought out these ideas, the matchless charms of Christ in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard. Accepting the conversations between myself and my husband, she's referring to 1881. And then she says, and when another presented it, Every fiber of my heart said amen. Ellen White saw this clearly as a fulfillment of what God had promised. There's a message he's seeking to bring to the church. James and Ellen White wanted to emphasize this through books and preaching, but James had chosen not to. God promised he would raise up others, and Ellen White saw this at Minneapolis as a fulfillment. In fact, she would say other places, notice, I would have humility of mind and be willing to be instructed as a child the Lord has pl been pleased to give me great light, she says, yet I know that he leads other minds and he opens to them the mysteries of his word and I want to receive every ray of light that God shall send me, though it should come through the humblest of his servants. She wrote this at Minneapolis. She's saying that, you know, God gives me light. She was inspired of God and yet God sent light through others and she recognized it, and she was calling the church to recognize it as well. Notice again another place. She says, God has sent men to bring us the truth that we should not have had unless God sent somebody to bring it to us. Let me have a light of what his spirit is, and I therefore accept it, and I no more dare lift my hand against this per these persons because it would be against Jesus Christ who is to be recognized in his messengers. So again, Ellen White didn't never stood up and said, look, I'm the inspired prophet of the Lord. You don't need to listen to anybody else. Just read my writings. She actually admonished, listen, the Lord is sending a message. Well, R.T. Nash kind of summarizes it. He says, from Mrs. Ellen G. White's attitude and words at that time, it was plain that she stood 100% with Elders Jones and Wagner in the messages they were presenting at the general conference meeting. <clears throat> so Ellen White was standing behind them saying, Amen. And that's what created an even greater problem. It got so bad that there was even heckling going on during the meetings. There was considerable heckling of Wagner and Jones. Though uh, E.J. Wagner was short, he could be plainly heard. However, because of his stature, someone called out tauntingly, we can't see you. The thrust was made to hurt him, and it did. There's a whole story behind this. Wagner was only about five foot two, and his stature was a kind of an issue with him. He he was troubled by it. And he thought sometimes people were prejudiced against him because of his stature. And Ellen White actually wrote him a, a testimony against that attitude in the 1870s and it was published in Testimonies Volume 4. So I think people knew that about him and they used that as something to taunt him with in the meetings. Well, G.B. Starr, this is how he recalls it. He says it was our privilege to attend this meeting and to daily listen to Sister White as she unqualifiedly endorsed the powerful and convincing presentations of this vital subject from the books of Romans and Galatians. Never were clear proofs given to the assembly, to an assembly that the Lord was speaking through the spirit of prophecy. Morning after morning, Sister White would reveal 
the words and conversations of individuals spoken in their private chambers. In other words, after the meetings, the brethren would break up and go to their rooms, and Ellen White that night would be taken into those rooms and heard what was being said in private. And then she would confront some of those ministers in the morning. F. H. Westfall said this, I will relate what I remember of the 188 General Conference in Minneapolis. It rings in my ears still how Sister White earnestly appealed to the conference to accept the message of justification by faith. She said that she was carried in vision from room to room where the delegates were located in Minneapolis and heard their conversations and ridicule of the message of justification by faith. They said that Sister Wright was growing old and getting childish and that the young men, Jones and Wagner, had her under their thumb and had influenced her to uphold them and whatever they were teaching. It got, actually got to that point. Instead of believing Ellen White in person, they actually thought she's been influenced and she's being controlled by these men. C.C. McReynolds says this, in our lodging houses, we were hearing a good many remarks about Sister White favoring Elder Wagner, and he was one of her pets. The spirit of controversy was up, and when the delegates came in from the last meeting of the day, there was simple babble, much laughter, joking, and some very disgusting comments were being made. No spirit of solemnity prevailing. A few, notice how he categorizes it, a few did not engage in the hilarity. No worship hour was kept, and anything but the solemnity that should have been felt and manifested on such an occasion was present. R.T. Nash said, many who attended the meetings of that conference know of what took place at the conference meeting. When Christ was lifted up at the, as the only hope of the church and of all men, the speakers, Jones and Wagner, met a united opposition from nearly all the senior ministers. They tried to put a stop to this teaching by Wagner's and Jones. That's really how far it went at Minneapolis. And I realize this is heavy stuff, but I'm just glossing over a broad paintbrush view of what happened during those meetings. Well, Ellen White, this is how she talks about that more fully. I never felt more decidedly the spirit, felt more decidedly the spirit of the Lord moving upon me than at the meetings. And I know the angel of the Lord were standing by my side to help me. It seemed, I seemed to live as in a clear light of the son of righteousness. So Ellen White was being lifted up by the message. But the spirit that prevailed at that meeting was not the spirit of God. I had to bear a decided testimony against the spirit that prevailed. But notice, but my testimony was treated with indifference as idle tales. I was charged with being influenced by my son, W.C. White, Elder Jones, and E.J. Wagner. While at Minneapolis, he bade me, Ellen White talks about how the, the angel would take her now, Follow him from room to room that I might hear what was spoken in the bedchamber. The enemy had things very much his own way and I heard no word of prayer but I heard my name mentioned in slurring and criticizing ways. Well, what was the result of that? Ellen White even years later said, I shall never, I think, be called to stand under the direction of the Holy Spirit as I stood at Minneapolis. The presence of Jesus was with me. All assembled in that meeting had an opportunity to place themselves on the side of truth by receiving the Holy Spirit, which God was sent, which was sent by God in such a rich current of love and mercy. But in the rooms occupied by some, the of our people was heard ridicule, criticism, jeering, laughter. The manifestations of the Holy Spirit were attributed to fanaticism. That's how far it went. 
during those meetings? Well, on October 24, Ellen White actually decided there's no use for me to stay here because people won't listen to what I'm saying. I might as well go somewhere else. And she packed her bags and she was ready to leave. And that night, an angel came and said, for this work, the Lord has raised you up from your deathbed. His everlasting arms are beneath you. In other words, the angel said, this is why you didn't die this summer. You were supposed to be here, and you're to stand at your post of duty. From this meeting, the angel's still talking here, from this meeting, decisions will be made for life or death. Not that anyone need perish, but spiritual pride and self-confidence will close the door that Jesus and his Holy Spirit's power shall not be admitted. That was what happened. But I am so thankful that the angel didn't put a period there and stop. They shall have another chance to be undeceived and to repent and to confess of their sins and to come to Christ and be converted that he may heal, heal them. And I have to tell you, the reason I'm a Seventh-day Adventist today is because of that. I was raised in an Adventist home, but walked out the back door, and the Lord led me to start reading on Adventist history, and when I discovered Christ's mercy in our own history, it changed my heart toward him. I felt like he'd been lying about coming all these years, just holding out or something. And then I realized Jesus has been longing to return for over a hundred years. When I purposed to leave Minneapolis, Ellen White continues talking about this. The angel of the Lord stood by me and said, not so. God has a work for you to do in this place. The people are acting over the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. It's not you they're despising, but the messengers and the message I send to my people. Unless every soul shall repent of this, their sin, this unsanctified and independence that is doing in the they will walk in darkness. They would not that God would manifest his spirit and his power, for they have a spirit of mockery and disgust at my word. Think about how God felt at this point. He's wanting to pour out his Holy Spirit. He's sending a message rich in mercy and love, justification by faith, law and the gospel combined. And that's how it was met. This is how Ellen White would summarize it for years. This meeting was the saddest, has been the saddest experience of my life. The position and work God gave me at that conference was disregarded by nearly all. Rebellion was popular. Their course was an insult to the Spirit of God. Now, I forgot to mention when I started. I'm not trying to throw rocks at our pioneers. Many of them gave their lives for the cause. But some of them in that meeting, who had done great things, somehow misunderstood what was happening, and they ended up on the wrong side. Now, some of them repented and thanked God that he forgives, but, you know, there are still consequences David fell away and he repented, but his life after his uh, adultery and murder of Uriah um, was not like it had been before. Sin brings consequences, and God forgives us, but he doesn't always remove those consequences. Ellen White, another thought she shared was that Christ was wounded in the house of his friends. She actually quotes that text and applies it to what was happening at Minneapolis. We apply it to the first coming, which is true. She applied it to Minneapolis. Well, in closing, the delegates at the closing of the meeting carried away, says W.C. White, very different impressions. Many felt that it was one of the most profitable meetings they had ever attended. Others that it was the most unfortunate conference ever held. And this really happened. I quoted from R.T. Nash and McReynolds and, a, and a, a few others 
who were there, uh, GB Star, who rejoiced. They said, praise the Lord. But for others, it, it all seemed dark and terrible. F.H. Westfall said this, the message at Minneapolis became most precious to the heart of Westfall. It was sweet music to my soul, he declared. He went back to Plainfield, Wisconsin, and he told his church that the latter rain had started. And as a result, one farmer sold his farm, put much of money into the Lord's work, took up canvassing, and was finally ordained as a minister. So Westfall went back. He rejoiced, but many others did not. And this is what happened at Minneapolis. Well, Ellen White made a very interesting statement on her last talk, October 24, 1888. She said to the minister she's presenting, now this is the last minister's meeting we will have unless you wish to meet together yourselves. If the ministers will not receive the light, I want to give the people a chance. Perhaps they may receive it. And that's what happened. Ellen White, uh, the next year, camp meetings. She was joined by Jones and Wagner, Haskell and others. Prescott would join Loughborough later. And revivals begin to take place across this country. In fact, this afternoon, which I, that's what I look forward to sharing, is some of those revivals. But I don't think we can understand the significance of the revivals unless we understand the context of how they happened and the message that brought them about. And what I find so interesting is that the first place they went where there was a revival was to South Lancaster Academy among the young people. Young people, God wants to raise you up as a generation that will say amen, whatever you say. So this afternoon, we're going to look at what happened when the simple story of the cross was presented. I do want to mention, too, that this evening, after the last meeting, uh, I guess the um, Brother Powell told me that there's a box of these books that will be given out free to whoever wants a copy. These, this is kind of a compilation of some of the articles that Jones and Wagner wrote. I also brought a copy of Taylor Bunch's book from uh, 1928 uh, that I will give to whoever wants a copy, although I didn't realize there was an academy here. I'm really sorry, academy students. I thought it was just the college, so I didn't bring uh, enough, but I brought a, a number and I can get more. So anyways, what's the point of th this morning? Well, in some ways, when we look at Minneapolis, Obviously, there was two receptions. One was rejecting, one was accepting, but we're still here today, 2018, and we're praying for the latter rain, and my hope is that we will learn some lessons from our history because God is going to come again with light and truth from heaven, not new light. It's always been in the scriptures, but to reveal truths to us and we want to be open and ready to accept that. And now's the time to prepare. I guess we have a closing song, if you would stand with me. It's uh, hymn number 620, uh, 268, Holy Spirit, Light Divine. <laughs>